Hello, everyone. You are listening to Love and Lifestyle on W4WN, the All Women's Radio Network. This is the show where we talk about passion, fashion, food, and fun. Love and Lifestyles is all about living life well. I'm your host, Susan Rich, the Get You Notice Now Marketing and Wordcraft Coach. When I'm not talking about the softer, sweeter side of living, I have some kick-butt ideas for getting your business noticed. Sign up for Rich Write Bites, and you'll get a weekly dose of writing and marketing ideas, plus show updates. And you can subscribe on the blog for SusanRichTalks.com. My co-host today is Anne-Marie Schutz, and Anne-Marie is a featured guest on Susan Rich Talks. She anchors the show every Monday for Living the Writing Life, and on Potpourri Friday, she steps us through the kind of homemade goodness our grandmothers used to share. Potpourri is Internet Radio's funniest Friday show, so why not join us and find out why? Good morning, Anne-Marie. How are you today? Oh, doing fine. How are you? I am doing just great, and I am so excited to be welcoming our guests on the show today. We've got uh, Rachel Grant and Jane Convoy coming on in the second half. And so, Henry, why don't you tell us a little bit about Rachel? Let's get our conversation started. Okay. As a trauma recovery and relationship coach, Rachel works with her clients to identify the patterns of thought and behavior that keep them from recovering from past abuse or improving their relationships. She's discovered, she's developed her coaching programs based on her own journey of recovery and learning and has been successfully working with clients for the past five years. Rachel holds a master's in counseling psychology and is a member of the International Coach Federation and San Francisco Coaches. Hello, Rachel. How are you? Hello. Good morning, Emery. Well, I'm very glad to have you on today because uh, this is a subject that seems to come up a lot how to trust yourself and others after childhood abuse. Mm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So I guess my first question to you is, why is trust such an issue after childhood abuse? I know that's one of those, well, duh questions, but. (laughs) Well, yeah, you know, many survivors struggle with trust. And, you know, it's not so surprising given that our fundamental trust in another person was shattered as a result of abuse. Uh, and in fact, many survivors really struggle to trust anyone or remember even that feeling of trusting, particularly if the abuse occurred in, occurred in childhood. You know, your, your foundation of what it means to relate to someone and get into a place where you have confidence in the other person and there's a give and take exchange is, um, torn and, and impaired from the very beginning. And, uh, you know, I know when I very first thought about trusting others, when I began this journey, I just kind of felt a huge knot in my stomach. It was the unknown. Uh, there was a fear around relying on the integrity or character of another person. After all, you know, I had relied on that integrity or character of someone and was abused. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. you know, and then I also had a very hard time believing that people wouldn't always leave or always let me down or harm me. So there was, you know, this terrible loop of kind of being out to prove that no one could be trusted, and I was succeeding, you know. Uh, And so when I started this journey of recovery and thinking about this very particular topic, I realized, you know, there are a couple of layers to trust, and uh, that, you know, defining trust, trusting ourselves, trusting others. And so I began kind of picking it apart and looking for a way to approach trust that made it uh, a workable concept after abuse. Okay, I have another stupid question. Why is trust so integral to a relationship? I mean, can you create a relationship that's not based on trust? Right. Well, we're going to talk about the various levels and layers of trust as we go along, but you will need some sort of connection of, of trust, whether it be small or large, and then that kind of depends at what level you reach when it comes to vulnerability and intimacy. I kind of see vulnerability and intimacy and trust as a uh, a triad. Mm-hmm. And so from the place of trust, once you get into trusting someone, you then uh, allow yourself to embrace vulnerability, become closer, open up to that person a bit more, which then leads to intimacy, mm-hmm. which then leads to one of the best payoffs of life, you know, sex. And you can get into <laughs> that and have a great time. You know, I mean, so it's all built and all layered together. So some people, you know, can really, they struggle, struggle, struggle with trust. 
and take a really long time at that stage. And then once they pop past that, you know, they, they can do in vulnerability, they can do intimacy, they can have a great sex life. Other people, for some reason, can, you know, manage all of those other steps, but when it comes to the physical intimacy, get blocked. So, you know, but, but trust is kind of like the gateway to all of these other experiences that we want to have in relationship. Okay. So, uh, Go ahead. Can I ask, just, just thank you. I just have to ask this quick question because it's something that I've always wondered and how, you know, when men, when women are sexually abused, either, either by, you know, family member, you know, for friend, clergy, uh, you know, they're raped or something. I've always wondered, how do you rebuild that intimacy? Because in my mind, I've always wondered, can you ever enjoy sex again? And so, and so I'd just like you to underline that again, Rachel, if you would, that the answer is yes, you can. Absolutely. You absolutely can reclaim your sexuality, your sex life. You can gr- create uh, an experience that you enjoy, that you like. It really comes down to, you know, separating out the sexuality that occurred w- when the abuse happened and realizing that that occurred out of obligation, no choice. You know, you basically were cornered. And mm-hmm. the sexuality as you're, as an adult that you're having in your partnerships is totally your choice and being able to break those two apart. There's a lot of, you know, little nitpicks and and other things to kind of look at, but that's the basic um, concept that I I work with my clients around is empowering them and letting them, helping them to come to understand that their sexuality is theirs. They can make choices about that. They have the right to choose. Oh, that must be huge though. Yeah, it is. Very difficult (laughs) path. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm, one thing I'm curious about when it comes to trust after abuse, I would imagine, and this would go for an adult who is in an abusive situation as well, you create all kinds of behaviors that let you cope with it because, you know, this is your reality. And getting rid of those behaviors must be extremely tricky. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, that's the program that I've developed, Beyond Surviving, um, is really about addressing all of those various behaviors that come about as a result of abuse. Mm -hmm. What happens when we're abused is that we take on certain beliefs and ideas about ourselves, about others, about relationships, and we just kind of start going out into the world and, you know, living that out, basically, on the day-to-day. And I know when I was, you know, in my own journey, I had drawn a lot of connections. I had come to a lot of conclusions, a lot of great insights about why I was behaving a certain way. But regardless of what therapy I was doing or group I was attending or book I was reading, there was one really important question that was not getting answered for me, and that was, well, so what do I do about it? Mm-hmm. I really wanted, you know, action steps, skills and tools that taught me, okay, yes, I understand why I'm not trusting, but then how do I get to that next step of actually being able to get into relationship? And so, you know, my answer to that question is the Beyond Surviving program. It It's about identifying the false beliefs and ideas that come about as re- abuse and then developing the skills and the tools for challenging that and moving on into what I consider this kind of final stage of recovery where you're no longer constantly battling and dealing with the effects of abuse, but you're living your life. You know, nobody wants to just survive their life. You know, Mm -hmm. we really want to live and be free. You know, one thing Mm. you had said um, early on, and and as I was reading your questions ahead of time, I kept thinking about intimacy Mm -hmm. and how does trust link to intimacy? Well, it's, uh, you know, when we begin trusting someone and finding areas where we can, the levels on which we can trust them to keep their commitments, to follow through, then that really opens the door for us to share more and more with them. And, and I like to think of intimacy as private and personal knowledge obtained mm. through much study and experience. Oh, that's and, nice. Yeah. Yeah. And so when we aren't trusting, you know, mm-hmm. we're not going to stay in relationship very long. You know, we're going to basically eject anytime it starts to get, you know, too close. We have to be too vulnerable. We don't have a tolerance for vulnerability. And so then we just kind of push, push everything away and keep everything at an arm's length. 
And so we never get that private and personal time because we're not trusting, we're not vulnerable, and we don't stay in long enough to really develop that, you know, prolonged study and experience of another person that leads to intimacy. Are there, uh, is there another way to respond besides pushing everyone away? Well, I think I think quite a few people um, who have been abused actually their trust meter. It's, the trust meter gets all wonky, <laughs> no, no uh-huh. matter what, and so you know it can swing all the way to just keeping everyone away to way you know, open wide. You know the gate is wow. open for everybody, wow. and so you know both of those extreme responses uh, to abuse are problematic. They each bring their own pros and cons and difficulties. And so what we want to do is to develop the skill of having, you know, being right in the middle where we're able to open the door and let people in and experience them and, you know, be patient to what that then brings into your life when you do it and Mm -hmm. then know how to shut that door if you need to and how Uh, to evaluate. Okay. Oh, no, I was just like, ah, this is what they mean by no boundaries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, actually, that makes it a lot clearer. Um, mm-hmm. So I guess, could you give me s- sort of a general example of, you know, a theoretical woman coming out of an abusive situation? What can she do? What is she feeling? Right. Well, you know, the first thing that you want to do, actually, in this area of trust, we often think of it as an external experience, something that we are doing with someone else. But actually, the very most important first step is to focus on trusting yourself. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that happens with abuse is we begin to doubt our ability to judge and evaluate situations. We incorrectly assign the blame to ourselves and think, well, you know, if I had made a better choice here or done something differently, you know, that abuse or that rape would not have happened. And so we begin doubting our own ability to make good decisions, to judge other people with wisdom and clarity, you know, to set the boundaries that are necessary when others violate our trust. So then because of that, if we even think about trying to trust others, it's actually just a very empty and meaningless endeavor because if you aren't grounded in your own abilities, you know, you're not going to be able to look outside of yourself and see things with clarity. Mm, mm-hmm. I'm nodding here. Yeah, that makes mm. a lot <laughs> okay. of sense. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it really does. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So really being grounded in who we are, confident in our ability to make good decisions, and able to set and keep boundaries are really critical components of trusting others. So we want to think about what beliefs, what ideas are really holding us back from trusting ourselves. So you can always start very small and just setting a goal that focuses on just one area where you really want to begin learning to trust yourself. And it's a good place to begin. You know, it could be even something small like, Keeping, keeping your word or keeping a promise that you make to yourself, maybe about, you know, I'm not going to have that piece of chocolate. You know, I'm going to cut back on sweets or I'm going to go for a walk every day. Like building up, you know, we come to know and trust ourselves by paying attention to w- what we are saying we will do and mm-hmm. following through on that, right? And uh, paying attention to the judgments we make and seeing how they play out and noticing when we're on point, noticing when we miss something and developing a clear picture of our ability, you know, to make good choices. So it almost sounds like what you're teaching people is how to, to get power over their own life, how, how to control what's happening to them, because in an abusive situation, you don't have that. That's right. Well, yeah. And so instead of control, I would say, um, wisdom and clarity, right? Because okay. we really, at the end of the day, don't have a lot of control. <laughs> but we can't, you know, even when we do our very, very best, right? Mm-hmm. There are still things that will happen that, you know, regardless of how well you prepared or how many skills and tools you have, things are going to go a little wonky. That's just the nature of life. Mm-hmm. So, you know, trying to get to the place of, you know, being controlling is, you know, a slippery slope as well, but you can increase your chances of success, right? You can improve um, the percentage and and the likelihood that things will will turn out the way that you hope. So it's really about helping people um, understand that they really are at choice in their lives. They don't have to continue 
just being affected by the abuse, you know, that is a stage of life that occurred in the past. Mm -hmm. And I want to bring them to the present and help them break free of that so that they can really then step into their future powerfully and openly. Yeah, I like that. You're giving them power. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Empowering people. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would say that the thing that was missing when it comes to uh, abuse is, yes, it's kind of control, but I think the bigger thing is choice. Mm-hmm. And somehow what happens when abuse occurs is we stop believing that we have choices that we can make, whether it comes to how we think about ourselves, how we relate to other people, what kind of jobs we want to have, how we see our bodies. You know, it, there's something about abuse that just seems to put us into this place of thinking, I don't have a choice about anything, even when it comes to trust. We think, well, that's just, you know, the way it's going to be, and I'm just going to be stuck this way. And so Beyond Surviving is really about giving giving you the choice again. I so I, I have a, a question. Are there people out there who have um, their childhood is abusive from the standpoint that there's more emotional, there's not physical, there's not sexual abuse, it's just a very locked down environment, very controlling, where as adults you might not even be aware that you were quote unquote abused. How do you uh, work with people who haven't even, who don't understand that the life choices that they're making, their lack of joy, their frustrations, feelings of being stalled are there because they never learn how to make their own choices? Mm. Well, yeah, I do um, offer the Beyond Surviving program with people who have been emotionally abused or physically abused as well, you know, with some adaptations. And, you know, essentially, whenever you have an area of life where you're feeling stuck, where you feel like there isn't any energy or flow or power, you know, that's evidence that something is a little bit off. And so quite often, you know, clients might come to me and they might not understand the connection between all of those things and how it all plays together, but they know something's not working, right? Mm -hmm. So we just start with the what's not working. And through that conversation, through looking at, you know, why they are blocked in the area of life where they are, we can dig down and get to that place of, you know, what are the fears and concerns that are holding you back and working around those false beliefs and challenging those false beliefs so they can kind of step out of that and move on. Wow. Okay. Um, I'm just thinking that it must be such a huge step for someone like that to to seek counseling in the first place. Well, you know, I think it's interesting. I think that part of the um, psychology around um, sexual abuse in particular is that is life sentence. Like it's it's something that's going to take a long, long time. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the program that I've developed is 16 sessions. And, you know, over and over again, my clients reach that end, the end of that program and are like, yes, this, you know, this 16 session program did more for me than 10 years of therapy. Wow. And I think the reason for that is, and not that they, you know, life is just a bowl of roses for them after that, but, you know, they're still going to have little bits and pieces that they're going to have to work on. But the, the thing about Beyond Surviving is that it really is about getting you into action, getting you moving getting you to face and understand what's happening and then do something about it, right? I'm not, we're not just on the couch talking and rehashing and playing it all out again over and over and over again. It's Mm -hmm. really about, okay, you know, I get that that's what happened. So what? Now Mm -hmm. what are you going to do with your life? Now what's next for you? I'm nodding very hard here because I have um, (laughs) an acquaintance who, spent an awful lot of time in therapy, reliving her trauma. I mean, we're talking like 20 years of reliving her trauma. And, and that's all she is, is a traumatized person. Mm -hmm. She's never gone past. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And therapy plays a very important role. When I talk about the stages of recovery, you know, victim, survivor, beyond surviving, I think people who are in the survivor stage, which basically means they're just now starting to identify as a survivor, maybe they haven't told their story, maybe they haven't given it a lot of thought about the impact and the role that the, the abuse has played in their lives, and they're just now kind of starting to identify those things. Being in therapy is a great place because you need to, you know, kind of do that analytical work, reflective work, right? Mm -hmm. But once you reach that place where you're like, okay, I get it, I understand it, now I'm ready for what's next, that's really where Beyond Surviving comes in. Yeah, that's that's got to be extremely helpful. 
And yeah. it, it's, I don't know what the word is. It's systematic, right? You know, yeah. like you do this, you do this, you do this. Yep, exactly. It's it's a it's a toolkit. You know, I tell okay. people, and these are tools I use. It's not like some, you know, it's drawn on cognitive behavioral therapy. It's drawn on Buddhism. It's drawn on you know books I've read, things I've done, what worked for me. And I think mm-hmm. that's another reason why the the program, you know, an impact because these are the tools that I use all the time. Mm-hmm. So you know, for instance, when it comes to trust, you know, my uh, definition and my relationship to trust is that, first of all, trust is not about judging the character or quality of another person. And, you know, we can't come to trust a person as a whole. Rather, we come to trust the person to honor specific commitments. And then most of all, no one is 100% trustworthy. I think this is, you know, one of the mistakes we make is trying to figure out, are you trustworthy or are you not? And it's actually a little bit more complicated for that. So, you know, for example, if you have a person who you work with and they're always on time, they always show up for their projects, they get things done by those deadlines, but they cheat on their taxes. Mm -hmm. Well, that person is really completely trustworthy when it comes to completing tasks on time, but is not so trustworthy when it comes to April 15th, right? Oh, that's an interesting point. It is. It is. It's, 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 it's balancing the relationships and adding some perspective into it. That's right. So for any given person, there's always some commitment that we can trust every person, some commitment that we can trust them to keep. But there is always something that we cannot, even for our most intimate and our most our close people who we say, you know, I would you know, lay everything on the line for. Even those people will have things that we can trust them to do and things that we can trust them not to do. And so that's why trust is not about judging the character or quality of a person, but really about judging and evaluating the commitments that you can trust that person to to make. And so when we are relating to others, we really want to look for those components. Like, yeah, I know I can really trust this person about that, but not about this. And so that doesn't mean that they are all 100% trustworthy or all not. It just means I can really clearly see where I can trust them and where I can't. And so when it comes to wanting to build those deeper relationships, right, getting into where, well, intimacy, right, we Mm -hmm. can be a little bit intimate with people or we can be really deeply intimate. And the people who we go very deep with, of course, we're going to want them to be willing to keep commitments that align with our own values and more so than somebody who say we just trust to, you know, give me my change at the, mm-hmm. at the store and I go and <laughs> yeah. buy something, right? Mm-hmm. That's trust. But that's you a know? great that's, point, yeah. That, that, is a, that is a great point. And uh, we have just a couple minutes left, Rachel. So you've mentioned a program that you have, and then I see that you've also got, is that a book, Learning to Trust Yourself and Others After Childhood Abuse, or the name of your program? So the name of the program is Beyond Surviving. I do have a guidebook, a workbook that I use with my clients, um, both individually. I do coaching by phone and by Skype, so they don't have to be in the neighborhood. Um, And uh, I also am going to be putting together some small groups here in San Francisco. Um, If people visit my website, www.rachelgrantcoaching.com, They'll see a section towards the bottom called Latest News, and if they sign up for the newsletter, they can get parts one and parts two of my book for free, so they can kind of get a sense of what the program is like, and um, and so if they want to think about doing coaching, they can sign up for a free discovery session, they can give me a call or email me, um, and so yeah, lots of ways to get in touch with me, lots of ways to go deeper into this work and explore this topic, plus many others. The book really covers, you know, all of the whole spectrum of, you know, evaluating the abuse, getting connected to what happened, skills and tools for challenging false beliefs, dealing with the emotions that arise as a result of abuse, and then a lot of work around relationships, as well as skills for moving on, you know, and having a conversation with the abuser if that's something a person wanted to do. Wow. Mm. Wow, that is really very powerful. So, Thank you for coming on the show with us today. Uh, it's been great having you here. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the chat room is is very appreciative. This is oh, wonderful. an important topic. It's a very thank important you. topic. So thank you again, Rachel, and have a wonderful day. And you as what, well. 